It's always um, referred to as one of the top three Israeli novelists, often the number one Israeli uh, novelist in terms of the quality of his work. Uh, he's not only, uh, you know, every Israeli <laughs> knows who he is, and he's gotten many prestigious awards in Israel, but uh, as many of you know, his, he's written 14 books, mostly fiction, but also nonfiction, and much of that has been translated into 30 different languages, so he's gotten awards in France and Germany and Italy, uh, and he's pretty well known around the world. He also has three or four movies uh, based on his books. One we screened at MSU in December about the Zigzag Kid, which was a uh, place in, in the Netherlands that some of you had a chance to see. Um, and it's really kind of an incredible spectrum as to what he writes to, children's literature, um, nonfiction that's, you know, um, politically related to some of the students here, I think, read in Yuval Ben Siman's class, um, and also a lot of uh, different kinds of fiction. Um, so he's just, oh, there's Yuval Ben Siman, so he's a really incredible author. Um, and commentator, uh, and it's really an honor to have him here. Many of you know he was born in Jerusalem uh, and spent all of his life, um, I think, in Israel. Um, it was kind of interesting. We got a chance to talk just a little bit before here, and I was saying that in, to the end of the land and in his latest book, there's a lot of walking going on among the people, and he said that that's what he does when he's writing, as he's walking while he's writing, so that's maybe he'll expand on that, and that's kind of interesting to see. And he's currently, I believe, writing another children's book um, for his uh, three-year-old granddaughter. He has two granddaughters, one who's a year and one who's three, and so he's writing it uh, for her, and so he's continually uh, writing. So it's a real pleasure to have you here with us. I thought the format we'd have is there's... Um, maybe uh, four of us in total that might ask a couple of questions each based on kind of not just the latest book that will be kind of the highlight this evening, but on all the body of work that uh, David Grossman has written about. We'll each ask our own questions, get some insights, and then we'll open it up to all of you and the students too who have read some of uh, David Grossman's work to, um, to ask further questions. Uh, so one question as a political scientist I had is it's really interesting um, kind of, I had two questions that relate to this, how you see yourself as an author um, also having kind of a political voice in uh, the Israeli political society, often directly or indirectly through your writing itself, especially in some of the nonfiction work, but also um, sometimes in joining demonstrations and joining movements with other uh, novelists and writers from the, around the world. I think I just read another article about you in the news just a couple days ago, maybe it was in the Aritz, that you we were talking about how many Israelis have legitimate fears, but sometimes those fears are manipulated or exaggerated, and you're supporting um, the EU labeling of settlements. So I was kind of interested in, A, how you see your role um, through your writing and as a kind of public intellectual in commenting and trying to engage and influence, perhaps, uh, politics, um, and then, you know, how you do so, and to what extent, and how you're trying to influence uh, things in that way. Shalom. 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 <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I will, I mean, I'm not sure if it was my choice that I would have started in uh, political. <laughs> Things, but I'll, I'll say very briefly. You asked about uh, how do I see my role. You know, I think the only role a writer has is to tell a good story, and uh, this is really the the thing that interests me. And I'm uh, this is the major part of my life. Uh, and mainly I, I, I write fiction and I prefer to write fiction. Uh, it's so much more rewarding to write fiction. There is something in the, the totality of, of creating a novel and the total commitment of the writer to the story uh, that I think I became addicted to after almost 40 years of, of writing. Uh, but of course, I live in a reality that is 
It's not a peaceful, not neutral reality, the reality of Israel. Uh, it's a very challenging reality in so many ways. I, I think of the things that we hear in every news bulletin, magazine, and it has to do, it has to do with so many existential questions and moral questions and questions that are so relevant to each and every one of us. Uh, there is now this election campaign here in the States and let's assume that one of the two, Hillary Clinton or Trump, would be elected. Uh, even, you know, even in the extreme event that Trump will be elected, I, I, I don't think that there will be an existential danger to the United States. There will be all kinds of problems maybe, but not existential. While in Israel, uh, a certain prime minister can doom the country uh, to such destiny that might be fatal. You know? and, and this is why I feel that I want to take part in the public dialogue in Israel. And I want to influence, uh, because it's my life, it's the life of my family, of my children and grandchildren. Uh, and I, I don't know if a writer has more to contribute to the political debate more than a carpenter or a <laughs> Cobbler, or a taxi driver, or a historian, or a journalist. But there are some, some elements that makes one a writer that enable him uh, maybe to be more fruitful in this, in this political debate. Uh, one of them is the sensitivity for words, because the language is the first thing that is being manipulated and forged in a situation of war like our situation. We live in war for more than a hundred years right now. Sometimes it's more calm, sometimes there are very severe eruptions, and usually there is this routine of animosity and of hatred and bloodshed. We call it Hamatzav. You know, we have this password in Hebrew, Hamatzav means the situation, but actually it's a kind of a euphemism because Hamatzav indicates to some Stability in Hebrew, you can even hear the, the, the resemblance in the sound. Matzav Yatsiv. Do you hear? Can you hear the Matzav Yatsiv? Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing that one can say about this Matzav, this situation, is that it is Yatsiv, that it is stable. It is not stable and it's not, as it, uh, the name indicates, it's not something that fell off on us like a divine decree. Uh, it's an ongoing bloodshed for, for more than a hundred years. And in such situation, of course, the language starts to be distorted. And it is distorted by the government, and by the army, and sometimes by our own fears, and sometimes by our enemy. Uh, and, and I think writers are people who, by nature, they have this kind of sensitivity to words that are being used or abused by others. And especially because in such severe situation, there is a tendency both to generalize and to stereotype and to use you know, words that are like drums or trumpets. And if there is something that a writer is allergic to, is, is such manipulation of, of the language. Because I think all our work as writers is about nuances. It's about trying to achieve precision in a thick world. And the way to achieve precision, for me, is, is really to find the right word and to call things by the right name and not by the names that are suggested to us, the people, by the government, by the media, and by the whole situation. But I think that the thing that makes 
or drives some writers, not all of us are really active politically in Israel, but some writers, uh, is what I think generates literature, and this is the, the need to understand other people from within. This is what we do when we write a character. Yes, we are trying at the best way we can to understand another human being from within. We try to understand him not by projecting on him or on her our inner world, but really to try to understand him through his own constitution, in his own terms. And this is, for me, this is literature. The ability to totally being populated or to surrender totally to the inner structure and inner constitution and inner story of another human being. And this human being can sometimes be someone totally different from me. And it can be, I can write about a child who is four years old and I can write about person, an old man who is uh, 90 years old, and I can write about a Palestinian, and I can write about, uh, from a point of view of, of a woman, like in, in To the End of the Land, and I can write, I wrote in Sea Under Love about, from, from a point of view of a Nazi uh, commander of an extermination camp. And in all these attempts, I really tried as, as hard as I could to be them, really to totally have this really pleasurable moment that I am able to <coughs> explore the, the filament, yes, this thread of, of light and warmth that goes inside another human being. Uh, and I did it also uh, when I wrote about the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. I felt already, I think, more than 30 years ago when I was writing uh, my first novel. It's called The Smile of the Lamb, Lamb uh, which is, it was the first novel to be written in Hebrew about the occupation, which is amazing if you think about it. I wrote it in 83. The occupation started in 67. It started after the Six Day War, when I think five Arab countries declared war on Israel. Uh, Israel attacked before they attacked her as a, in a kind of a surprise attack on the 5th of June, 1967. And the rest is uh, history and uh, geography and tragedy because we became from a very small country, we became almost like an empire. We enlarged our territory fivefold. And so many things happened to us because of, of this victory that turned out to be more and more a defeat for us in, in many ways, and a danger for us as a country, as a society, as a democracy. But it took 16 years until any Israeli was able to write a novel about this situation. It is really food for thought. And by the way, ever since then, I don't think that more than, what, three, four, five novels have been written about the occupation. There is a kind of a general collective reluctance to look into, into the situation, into the, the roots of the matzav of the situation. And I think that the only way to really not only really understanding, but to really, really to be in this situation is that we shall look at it from all points of view, from our point of view, the Jews in Israel, and the point of view of the Palestinians. <coughs> if we look at it only from our point of view, as most Israelis do, what we see is the projection of our wishful thinking, of our nightmares, we do not really see reality, because reality consists also of the stories and the suffering and the justice 
of the Palestinians. I do not say that they are, they have the full justice or the whole monopoly on, on suffering. I think we share both, we and them, we share both suffering and a sense of our justice and our vulnerability and we have our fears. But you must allow yourself, you must allow the, the story of the other to infiltrate into your own story, into the, the official story that the country or the collective tells itself. And usually the collective is very reluctant to allow other stories to penetrate his story. And it says, people will say, it will weaken us, it will weaken our argument, it will weaken our affinity to this place. I think it's just the other way around. I think that if you, if you allow that, then you are able you are able to do many things. And one of them, this is the beginning of the, of your ability to solve the conflict between you and your enemies. Because for the first time, you do not see a stereotype in front of you, but you start to see human beings, and you start to understand why they act the way they act. How do they regard the conflict? What do they think of you? How do you look? in their eyes. We prefer not to know. Generally speaking, when there is a conflict between states, and one state directs its dark side to the other, uh, we always tell ourselves, you know, it's only temporary. We just do it now for some years until the war is over, then we shall go back and we shall not have this dark side. We shall not be so cruel, so militant, so aggressive. Uh, but maybe it is the enemy who sees this dark side of us and he realizes even before we do to what extent those dark qualities have infiltrated into our internal organs and how they change us and how we become slowly, slowly all the things that some decades ago were our nightmare and now they are our daily life and they are part of us in a way that I don't know how it will be to be how it will be possible to get rid of it. Uh, so it was a very long answer, and even even that was only a partial answer, I must say, because because the situation is so complicated, and because it's, if you want to really hold all the story in your hand, you have to be able to contain so many contradictions. And it's, you know, after 100 years of war and killing, there is no one who is really innocent. Mm -hmm. And there is no one who is the only one to blame, the only, the, the, who, who burdens the guilt and the other, the other side is, you know, a saint. No, we, are, we have, all of us have blood on our hands there. And I try, I would say just that, I tried to write about what happens to people who live in such violent reality. How, how does it change us? What it does to the tissue of the family, to the fragility of the family? How do you raise up children? On what values do you raise them up? Because, of course, you want, to, you want your children to grow up and to be open and humanistic and pluralist and curious towards everyone. And yet there is always the fear that maybe by so doing I'm not preparing them for the life in this terrible, violent place. Uh, so from a point of view of a writer, Israel is really a paradise. <laughs> How many writers we have there? <laughs> Usually it's quite it's quite tough, and it's, uh, there is always the, the feeling of the fragility of this country, always the fear for our future. There is no real confidence that we shall have a future there. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll allow you to ask other questions. <laughs> I just had one follow-up question. Um, 
uh, and then I'll leave it to others. And that's kind of uh, a lot of your work directly relates to Israel, is about Israel, is located in Israel to the end of the land. They're walking through, uh, you know, every inch of, you know, of a trail of Israel. Um, uh, but much of it still has universal themes, even though it's taking place in Israel. Yet you made a decision in the last book and some of your other work um, to have it not take place in Israel at all. Um, and I was, you know, going to ask you to speak about that decision um, and whether, and we had talked briefly about this zigzag movie that we showed at MSU in December that took place in Israel in the novel, but it was taking place in the Netherlands in the film, and you seemed to enjoy it, but we were wondering after the movie how you would feel about that, you know, locating in a completely different country. So I wanted you to speak to, on one hand, the, the real conscious um, locality of Israel in much of your work, but also decisions to take it completely out of Israel uh, in other work. And oh, you also are saying that there was a play... It's the third question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's my daughter. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, almost always I write about Israel because it's the only reality that I know, the only reality that I can decode, the, the way the people behave, what they say, how they say it, the language, everything is, is familiar to me. And uh, I will not dare to write about uh, reality in even, you know, if I came to live here, maybe after 20 years I would dare to write about the reality here. But So Israel is, is the, really the only place that I know, and Hebrew is the only language that I can decode. Uh, and uh, when I wrote Falling Out of Time, it was very clear to me from the very beginning that uh, it tells about something that is the most universal thing, and this is uh, confronting death or trying to, to understand life after a, a loss, a painful loss. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you are Israeli or Palestinian or American or, or Chinese, we all stand in front of the, this mystery of death in the same way, and it was even important for me to, to clean this story from every rudiment of Israeliness. Yes, there, there is only, I think, one thing there that uh, uh, the, the man, the walking man, says uh, that uh, some a week after it happened, the catastrophe had happened. Uh, no, I want to refer to something else. He said that somebody came to me and told me that in a, in a language of another people, they call person who died in war, that he fell in the war. Of course, I think you say it also in English, but in Hebrew it, it has this strong meaning and, and echo, uh, and, but this is the only uh, mentioning of something that is close to Israel. Uh, maybe also because I wanted, I, I wrote this book, I, I should say it, uh, we lost our son Uri uh, almost ten years ago in the, in the war in Lebanon, and uh, when it happened, I was towards the end of writing to the end of the land, which actually tells about fear from a loss of a child, uh, and uh, maybe later I'll tell about to the end of the land, but when, when I finished to the end of the land, I decided that I want to write falling out of time because this was my reality then and I, I struggled in order to understand what, what life can be after such a loss when nothing in life can be taken for granted anymore. Uh, and uh, I felt that because Uri was a soldier I became so acquainted with the, the massive effort of the country to monopolize the death of soldiers and to praise soldiers and to idealize them. And probably it's also because of kind of a guilt feeling of the country for making this death possible. 
And the more the country feels guilty, the more it idealizes those who fail. And I felt a need to redeem the privacy and intimacy of his life, of his life as, as a baby, as a boy, as a young man, as an individual, as a civilian, not as a soldier. I didn't want anyone to be able to, you know, to mobilize him again after what was happened. And that's why, I guess, I guess that's why the instinctive decision was not to plant the, the book in, in a certain place, and by the way, not in a certain time, because you, there, there is also a mixture, mixture of time and mixture of all kind of uh, styles and, and genres. Partly it's a poem, partly it's a radio play or prose, all kind of, when I was writing it, I all, I all the time told my wife, I don't know what it is. I don't, it's not a novel, it's not a, it's a creature. So it's a creature because it has a rules of its own. And by the way, these are the books that I love the most to read and to write. They, they set their rules and, and they cannot benefit from anything uh, that was written that was like that. Uh, it's the most uh, challenging, sometimes frightening book to write, <coughs> uh, but the, the most rewarding. Uh, so this is why it, uh, it, is, it happens everywhere. It happens on the very spot where, the last spot where the living can still feel the warmth of the dead. This is the, the goal of the walking man. <coughs> A part of you understand you you have read it. The men and the women they uh, they lost their child five years, their son five years ago, and they have not spoken in these five years. And they have not spoken because even the language cannot be taken for granted. Uh, something is is broken even in in the attitude towards the language because the language cannot really grasp. Or, or contain what has happened. And I, I will also tell it that probably later because I'll, I'll talk about this book, but I'll, I'll tell you now that throughout the time of writing it, of the year and something of writing uh, falling out of time, I was all the time in this, I was torn all the time between the urge to write it and the urge to not write it. How dare I write about something like that? How dare, dare I put it into small, petty, limited words? And at the same time, how dare I not write about it? How I evade my... <coughs> my only way that I know to be within my life, and this is the way of writing. And. I think the book reflects this tension, even the, the thin lines, as if between saying something and saying nothing. Uh, and by the way, if I jump to the zigzag here, the zigzag is the other book of mine that can, can happen in every other place, I think. Uh, I would not have allowed to make a movie of a uh, the smile of the lamb, or to the end of the land, that will take place in another place. But the story of uh, Nono in uh, the Zigzag Kid is really not the story of an Israeli child, but of a child, of a child who is tormented by the contradictory urges and energies within him, and he cannot, he cannot know who he is. He's torn all the time. He's tormented with all those inner volcanic eruptions inside him. Uh, and I loved the, the, the movie. It was, it was a great movie. And if you noticed, I'm there in, the last, in one of the last pictures, uh, like I did in all my four movies. Me and uh, Hitchcock, we are the same. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's so fun, because it allows me to be on the set for at least one or two days. And you cannot imagine what pleasure it is 
to see things that you have imagined in your room. I, I write somewhere, I'm, I live near Jerusalem, under the ground. I mean, they, they put me in the cellar. I mean, my status in the family is terrible. Oh. <laughs> so, and I sit there, and I fantasize, you know, I fantasize. Suddenly I go out, and there are hundreds of people, and cameramen, and soundmen, and all this. And they are trying to, to make my imagination come true. It's really a, a very sweet feeling. <laughs> Um, Professor Yuval Ben Ziman uh, did a PhD in literature and conflict at University. He's teaching here for the year. He's a Sterling visiting Israeli scholar, as well as a scholar. Um, so I wanted to. I'll, I'll have just a ask a follow up question. First of all, okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll ask a follow up question from Monty. I'll just ask how do you feel with the, the translation of your, of your um, books? Because mm -hmm. you're a, a great art. Uh, those of you who don't speak Hebrew, I'll tell you he's the best Hebrew writer there is. Um, <laughs> probably one of the best live authors that, uh, like writing secular Hebrew in the last hundred years. Um, and, um, Where have you been all my life? <laughs> I, I'm a fan. I'm I agree. You. I agree with everything you said. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you feel with the translation? I don't know if you read the translations of, of, of the books to English or other languages you know. because. For me, reading you in Hebrew and then thinking, how can this be translated to English? I think it's impossible. Um, I don't know. I was wondering how you feel about it. But first, uh, thank for the compliments. Uh, I just started. Yeah. <laughs> be more to no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, uh, I have a great translator to English, uh, Jessica Cohen. She is really great, and I'm very, very lucky with the. Uh, I think most of my translators, those I, I, I can read only English and Arabic, uh, but. Uh, English I do read. I mean, I read the translations and I go over the translations. But because I am aware of the difficulty of translating me, I did in the last two uh, novels. One is Falling Out of Time. And the other novel is called uh, A Horse Walks into a Bar uh, that will be released here uh, in the beginning of 1917. Uh, 2017, sorry, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll say some words about it uh, later. Uh, but both books, uh, Falling Out of Time and A Horse Walks Into a Bar, are each one of them is written in a, in a different style and a very specific style because you read Falling Out of Time, so I don't have to talk about it, but the horse book is a stand-up comedy session. The whole book is a stand-up comedy session, and there is that one uh, comedian, stand-up uh, comedian, and he tells a story to the audience, and uh, there are many jokes in it, and it's a mixture of jokes and horror. Uh, and I felt that uh, I need to work very closely with my translators. So there is a place in uh, Germany, it's called Strahlen, it's a little town in Germany, near the Dutch border, and there is a center for translation. And in this building, there are 24,000 volumes of dictionaries. <laughs> it's for, for translators, it's really paradise. Uh, it is, there are dictionaries for uh, terms of